What is up, everybody? Welcome into a special Monday episode of Shout at Buffalo Bills football podcast. And listen, I just have been missing this guy. So I'm like, it's been a couple of months since we've been regular inside the Bills media room. So I'm like, Joe B, Joe Biscalia from The Athletic. Let's uh, let's rack, let's rack it up here. Let's let's get after it on a podcast. What's up, buddy? How are you? I'm good. I'm especially honored that you are bringing me in on the eclipse day uh, of all ah, days. Yes. So uh, do you have big plans? Are you going to go out and stare at the sun? We are. Okay. I'm a little bit nervous about the cloud cover. So we'll see <laughs> okay. if we get a chance to actually see it. But we got sure. our glasses. The kids got sure. the kids got like glasses in like five different um ways like we got like 25 pairs of these glasses that we're never going to be able to use we're that seems above average <laughs> i know but like everywhere they were going like like school like uh sports people were handing out glasses so we got we got a bunch so we will get after that um little bit of housekeeping here this saturday night come out to wing nuts it's our monthly live show and it's a fun one it's going to be a live mock draft we're going to set up a little station uh ryan and i are going to go pick by pick we're going to involve some fans that are there we're super excited about this show it might be an absolute mess but hey let's have a little fun let's get let's get after it on a on a saturday night it'll be uh we're, we're closing in on the draft there's a lot to talk about it uh and we're going to talk about the draft specifically with you joe in a little while but the, the overarching conversation on today's show, I want to be about digs and maybe some of the stuff that we haven't really talked a lot about. We talk about like what it means for the team, the decision to move off of them. But like we've covered Stefan Diggs in Buffalo for four years. And th there's been a lot that's gone into the evolution of this offense, the development of Josh Allen, what he's meant to the organization. And I got to thinking about what maybe aren't we talking about in the lead up to this that maybe made this such a shocking move? And and I and I was listening to uh, Over the Cap. They do a great job over there. And I was listening to his podcast. Um, and he was talking about the extension that the Bills handed Diggs in 2022 and how he thought um, it was bad business because the third contracts for non-quarterbacks are in this league super dangerous because of, you know, the age of the player, um, the, the failure to get, you know, the return on investment, uh, the sticky nature of getting out of the deal with all of the, the, the balloon numbers of the contract. So do you think, and I want to kind of dive into this, going back to that contract initially, that extension, was that a mistake? Well, the first thing that rolled into my mind about the the third contract thing is like, oh wow, they've got another one of those in Matt Milano uh, on their books right now. Uh, mm. But but that's a completely other thing. Um, I think the extension at the time when they signed it, Diggs was it was April of twenty two, so that means Diggs was twenty eight years old, and mm -hmm. so they were probably projecting forward because he was still twenty eight and still technically in his prime. I mean, last year he was still a a really good player. Um, right. They were probably projecting forward to say, okay, we're going to do this for the next um, three years and, and keep him here. At that point, there was no real like um, whispers of disharmony or anything like that. It was the first two years. It was a very hunky dory um, sort of symbiotic relationship. Um, and I think that's what compelled the bills to do this because at that point, like Diggs was model, model teammate and he him and jo his and josh's relationship was was awesome you know his on the field production was excellent you know there it, it it made sense from all that perspective i think where they could have gone wrong is rewarding for past success as opposed to projecting towards what could be down the line because i think they maybe fooled themselves a little bit that they just thought, okay, we rescued Stefan from Minnesota. Everything mm -hmm. that happened at the end of the Minnesota tenure is is not going to happen here. And you can convince yourself of that, but to do that and also to shell out that type of extension when they did, especially when he was still under contract, that's where it might um, it, it might get a little bit hairy. And I guess the catch twenty two here is if they don't extend him that probably accelerates the timeline of where Diggs doesn't feel like he's being um, 
I guess, respected enough because at the time of, of his deal, I think there was a boom in, in wide receiver contracts too. So uh, all that was, was that around the time of the AJ Brown trade? I want to say it was. Mm. Um, and, and AJ got a huge deal with the Eagles, if I'm not mistaken. So I think that that all kind of like syncs up to where there was these tons of wide receiver contracts, the bills thinking, okay, the last two years have been great. He's still in his prime. And then going from there. So looking back on it, usually most contracts, when you look back on it, they don't look great. Uh, and so I will say that, but Jason does a great job. He analyzes third contract stuff way more than I do. Uh, I am an avid reader of over the cap. So I'm, I'm not sitting here saying, Hey, what he said is wrong. I'm just saying it might be a little bit more nuanced uh, at the time of the deal than just, you don't do third contracts. Um, maybe they should have seen some stuff coming. What do you think? So I, I think overall it was rewarding a guy who had really made the Bills offense for those two seasons possible. I mean, he had a first team all pro season. He had this super close relationship with Josh Allen and helped kind of unlock that like superhero that we now know today in a lot of ways. Like if, if Diggs doesn't arrive in 2020 when he did, I mean, we remember 2019, there was a lot of good of Josh Allen that year. It wasn't what it's, what it was in 2020 when, you know, they had Cole Beasley in year two with Dable and Diggs just kind of like made everything come together and made them like a feared offense. Like they had all these different layers to their passing game. They had, you know, that, that intermediate area that was just dominated by Cole, the short intermediate area. They had the deep threat in John Brown in that first year, although he wasn't very healthy. And then they had Diggs, who was this prototypical separator and it, it felt like even if you were signing up for three more years, it didn't feel like something that was going to erode because of how they played together. The problem I think that popped up was like how Diggs dealt with the consistent failure in the playoffs. And I think at the heart of all of this, if down the line, maybe we get a glimpse truly into what really um, sullied the relationship between whether it was Allen and Diggs, we'll talk about that in a minute, but, but Diggs and the bills was just the, the repeated getting to the top of the mountain and then falling off right before you get to the actual top, um, which is obviously Patrick Mahomes. If, if they break through, who knows at some point, maybe even they go to a super bowl, but I think Diggs has had all of these seasons where he's been this, you know, documented tireless worker where he's putting in all this effort and, and maybe, you know, I know some reports are out there that maybe he didn't feel like everybody else was putting out that, that, that the effort. And I don't even know if those are reports as much as it's like hearsay from like, you know, talking heads and stuff like that. So it's really hard to wade through the water. So I guess that's another part of this is like the Stefan Diggs drama that we've kind of all been engulfed in locally, nationally over the last, since the Cincinnati Bengals game, like, do you feel like this was something that the Bills just had to get out of? Because another year of it could have been super toxic to the organization, even more so than it than it already has been. Well, I don't know that it was as toxic as some people are making it out to be, honestly. Mm -hmm. I think Diggs, and people can disagree with me, I think he's a vastly misunderstood dude, quite honestly. Um I think he is an intelligent, very self-aware, thoughtful person that understands what he's doing when he's doing it, but also doesn't has not allowed his personal feelings to get in the way for the most part of what of his work ethic and and trying to get the most out of out of everybody on the field. Um, so there is that now that said, was there some fatigue? Yes. I think, I think that is very obvious. Um, whether it was Stefan being fatigued with coming up just shy in the playoffs, whether it was fatigue of Stefan's, I guess, intensity, um, from, from the building, but there was some general fatigue to where the Bills have had opened themselves up to the premise of potentially trading him. But I will say this. I don't think, and I know this is something that we were going to get into a little bit, but 
I don't think the Bills came into this offseason going, okay, we're gonna we're just gonna wait until uh wait until we get an offer on this guy and then and then we're gonna move. We're definitely moving this guy. Mm-hmm. I think they legitimately went into this offseason with uh, from from everyone that I from everyone that I have talked to. They went into this offseason open to the idea, but also looking at Stefan Diggs as a part of their 2024 plans. And the thing I've been alluding to, uh, like like a kind of a, I guess an analogy here, is the Texans came in and basically, you know those, um, you, you go on Zillow, right? Yeah. You, know, you, you do that. Oh, yeah. Zillow. Okay. You go on Zillow and you see the blue dot where there's the people that ha- that say, well, my, my house is not for sale, but it's make me move. Like, give me the price that I want and I'll move. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what kind of happened here because the Bills looked at what the Houston Texans offered for a guy who's going to be entering his age 31 season on a huge contract. They had the cap space to do it. And then moving on from there to get what could amount to be an early second round pick next year, because Minnesota is in rough shape at quarterback right now. They've got Sam Darnold as their slated starter right now, that which is not the best of ideas. And then maybe a rookie quarterback, if they get into the top four or five uh, to do it. So the bills probably projected a little bit and said, all right, this is maximizing the value for him. 2025. He's totally off the books. And so, so the Houston Texans effectively gave them a make me move offer. And I think that's where this ultimately happened. Could is there a realm where Stefan Diggs is still on the team this year if they didn't get that offer? Probably, yeah. So in in that way, then you'd probably say that it wasn't at a point of no return in terms of the relationship. Right. But it doesn't it feel like a little bit in the aftermath of the trade, whether it be from the national narrative or even just some of the stuff that's come out. Like I mean, more than anything. The, the, the fire starter to all of this was, you know, another one of Diggs's tweets, like to a, just like a random fan on X 11 hours before he gets traded, where the fan was suggesting that Diggs wasn't essential to Josh Allen's success. And Diggs just chimed in, you sure? Also, like, what's the, like, the the thought process there from Diggs' side? Like, why do you wade into those waters, number one? Why do you perpetuate this Josh Allen distaste, which I think some people perceive you to have all of a sudden, right or wrong, fair or not. By doing that, you are literally taking a blowtorch to the conversation and starting that fire right back up again. I go back to in season. And I think one of the things that I kind of want to talk about is like, did we as a beat miss this? Like, coming and we've, we've alluded to it a little bit. I think your colleague, our good friend, Tim Graham was really kind of pressing this in season. Uh, I thought he was first on the Dorsey firing. Like he was kind of starting to, he started that off when he asked Sean McDermott, I think four weeks before he was fired, if he considered taking play calling away from Ken Dorsey and everybody kind of pushed back in the moment, but then it's like, well, they got to change something. Right. And then like over the course of the season, I remember that one press conference after Trayvon Diggs was really adamant are uh, really aggressive with his critiques, if you will, of the Bills and Josh Allen. Tim asked him in the press conference to, to Stefan, like, what's going on here? And it got a little bit um, heated, if you will, but he was there on it. I mean, the, some of the ingredients to an eventual parting of the ways, you know, we're, we're, we're in plain sight. Do we, do we miss this, that this was going to, we were going to get here. I know that, you know, what you just laid out, in terms of it, they didn't go into the off season thinking about this, but you wonder how much they were thinking about it in the season last year. I think, I think they have always, well, not always, I think around somewhere in between the 2023 season and, or I'm sorry, in between the end of the 2022 season and the 2023 season, they became open to the notion of, of dealing him because of that fatigue I was talking about. That's, that's the stuff that, that I have heard. Um, but he was too good of a player and like, they're not going to deal him for a couple of magical beans. So that it just, it just wasn't going to happen unless someone ponied up. I think in terms of looking for specific warning signs, um, I do think that there's, there, there could be some merit to that. The one 
thing that I will remember for for a while as to the maybe the the degrading of of the relationship um, between Diggs and the building is when I asked uh, Stefan Diggs how he would categorize how his um, relationship with Josh Allen has evolved throughout the season. I think this was in January, right before one of their playoff games. And usually in that spot, like in the past, Diggs has always been like, that's my guy. Josh is my guy. Josh is my guy. And he didn't go anywhere close to that. Like at one mm-hmm. point, I, I I don't have the exact quote right in front of me, but he was, he was basically like, you know, we've been on the field for, you know, doing this for the last, the last while. And um, at this point, it's, it's not personal, I think was around the quote of what he said uh, at, at one point of the answer. It was a very, very thought out answer, but that was just one little piece of it. I'm like, that's not what we're used to hearing whenever Josh Allen gets brought up. So I think that could have been a mini signal. Um, and certainly like you can extrapolate a bunch from, from a quote and say, be like, Oh, wow, look at this. Uh, I do think that some of his answer outside of that took a little bit of the teeth away from that specific sentence that I'm talking about, but he's also a very smart guy and he knows the weight of his words and he knows what he's saying at all times. He's, he's one of the most intelligent players I've come across, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he, so I think that was potentially a, a mini warning sign um, that that maybe something could be in the distance, but can I just break in here? Cause I have the exact I'm... quote. I'd like to read it. Go ahead. Um, how's your relationship with Josh evolved? Uh, here's what Dig said. I wouldn't say the relationship has evolved. I've been here. This is my fourth year here. So we've been rocking and rolling with the football for a little while now. So it's not so much this year. I feel like the success really breeds. Everybody wants to be happy when it's successful. Like when you're winning but you get closer with guys due to adversity. You get closer with your teammates in general when things aren't going right and you see who jumps in the wheelbarrow or gets out. So for me, relationship wise, it's not so much personal at this point. It's more so like, let's go get it. Let's win. Let's do everything that we can and stay in the right mind frame. You still grow as a family, but you grow as a family through the hard times, not just the good times. He gave you what eight, nine sentences there, and I don't think he said a thing about Josh Allen. Mm-mm. He, he, it was, it was a very easy opportunity to go. Yeah, Josh is my guy, and he has done it every single time we've asked him about Josh in the past. So maybe he had some fatigue about us ga- asking him because I never want to just, just pile on to one answer where you know if a guy has been asked about something a lot of times, I don't want to be like, okay, this is this is the the smoking gun here. This is exactly mm-hmm. what what happened, but. We at that point we had not talked to Stefan in what like over a month, right? And so I think it was it was a fair point just to ask him, you know, especially with some of the struggles that they had in connecting in games over the second half of the season. I thought it was a it was a fair fair thing to ask at that point. So maybe he had a little fatigue about talking about it, but even still, even if you have fatigue, you still usually rely on the things you have said in the past just to get through it and Mm -hmm. he didn't he didn't mimic those so not to get too academic here but i I studied communication in college and and not not typical communications like you know pr marketing so my major was actually in communication interpersonal comm you know group comm uh organizational comm public comm like every type of different you know communication method I, i took a class on it and so I've, I've often been so interested in the way that people talk or even the way that they behave with each other. And one of the big takeaways that I had from last season, especially, but it maybe was even present the year before, I can't really remember back, was that, and you could push back on this if you want, I felt like Josh and Steph, their relationship in the last couple of seasons was more for show than it was genuine so like when we would see those moments out at practice now this might be going a little bit too far because um i'm not in that huddle i'm not in those conversations i can i just see what i see and i could just make opinions based on that but 
there will be times we'd see them play full of practice. You'd see the videos go viral on social media and everybody would just be like, everything's fine. Don't worry about Diggs and Allen. They love each other. They're brothers. They're the best friends that were on the sports illustrated cover two years prior. But man, thinking back on it, I don't know if I can remember an instance last season from training camp on where we were in a locker room type setting and I saw them converse in any way. And obviously the, the anecdote that came out from Tim in his podcast last week, I think paints this in, in also another light in terms of maybe the disc cord in their relationship. But I almost wonder now if like Brandon was thinking, we can't go into next season with digs on the roster because we don't know potentially, like I, I'm, I'm obviously reaching a little bit here. We don't know exactly, but like with him on the roster, we we've seen a couple of pockets of bad, but we maybe we were we're waiting in uncharted territory if he's back. And I'm not trying to be disparaging towards Diggs. Maybe Josh has an equal role in this. I I don't know because I'm with you. I think every one of my interaction was was with Steph as a person was wonderful. I talked he's to him great. in the locker room. He's yeah, great. He's great. His 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 press conferences were as were more useful than. 90% of the other stuff that we get throughout the season. He's, he's a real dude and I'll always appreciate him for that. But there was an element of this stuff that I wonder if another year of it, no matter what they did to try to mitigate the problems was they were going to run into more. I think there was a disconnect between them. And I think there's more to the story than we know. Um, do I know exactly what that disc, what the reason for that disconnect was? No, um, been trying to find out, but no. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's what I tell people all the time. We're all trying to find out. We're yeah. all asking. We're all trying that. to find the guy who did this. Um, <laughs> no, it. Uh, I think there is there was a genuine disconnect, and I think your observations about them not and and keep in mind here, we in the media, we see everything at training camp. And then we see about 15% uh, during the season because the, the practice um, viewing rules change once they go in season uh, in, in the once that once they start approaching week one. So could have happened during individual practices when the media is not there, but in all, in all of the training camp slash, practice time that we saw and I was at every single practice this year except for the the few weeks where where my kid was born um I don't recall seeing them do what you're talking about and is that like a sign that maybe there was a little bit of a uh of a disconnect perhaps I think Josh was kind of a different dude last year which also adds to this like Think about the conversation before Ken Dorsey got got um, got canned. Like, I remember thinking to myself and writing about it honestly that Josh just seemed subdued, and yeah. for whatever reason. And the example I think I I, I might have brought this up on your podcast when when we chatted the last time I was on. But the the thing that I will always remember right before Dorsey got fired. Uh, was in that Broncos game where the Bills scored Josh Allen on a keeper to, I think, take the lead with under two minutes, if I'm not mistaken here. I'm, everything blurs together from a season. And he he scores. He runs towards the towards the um, the, the barrier of where the, where the fans are in the first row. And normal times, normal Josh, he's like, screaming his head off he's he's getting excited he's he's celebrating with the fans he go he gets super close to the fans and i remember seeing this in all 22 doesn't out about face and then just trots back uh without mm. celebrating anything and i'm like that's different so maybe there was a difference in josh last year which added to the relationship i also really found it interesting if we're if we're getting into the weeds here um the day that Diggs came back from from minicamp, I found it really interesting just watching Josh be all over stuff. Right, <laughs> like, like it was, it, he was like, he was like, performance hey, art. Hey, hey, you want to go? You want to go run with me? You want to go run with me? And like, it, it, it was, I get it to a certain degree because there was like a, okay, they need to handle this. He's a leader on the team, and and they need to be as one, especially before they they break for a, a month and a half. 
but I, it was just these are just general things that I found somewhat odd, and I think I think you're on the right track there. So what is that disconnect? I don't know. I mean, I think we've all heard stories, but I, I don't really want to want to. No, we can't. Yeah, we can't get into it. it. It's on. It's on the people involved to come up with anything. And listen, there's a conversation to be like, how much is owed? Right. They're very public figures, Josh, especially. Um, and he likes to keep all of that uh, as a Sean McDermott. And so that's kind of by design organizationally in house and under wraps. But it just it feels like there was this just great Super Bowl window that may still exist. Like we, we can get down the road, like when the, when the draft is done and we, we get that third or fourth wave of free agency in the books, we could talk about all that down the, down the road in the off season, but there was this great opportunity and you wonder how much the erosion of this relationship specifically between Allen and Diggs really just made it impossible for them to push through in these big moments. And it could be anything like, you know, like when you're, when you're at odds with, with somebody like maybe a, a family member or a best friend and, you know, something bubbles up and you have to have like, you know, a, a come to Jesus conversation moment. Like those are hard moments. And you're, you know, if there's an argument, I know for, here's a better example, marriage, right? Like when you're, when you're in the daily grind of a marriage and like, you made a point on something and then something comes up days later and completely flies in the face of the point that you made. And it's like, you know, the wife comes in like, see, I told you so. Like those moments probably happen in the team dynamic. And I, and I just think of the moment against the chiefs in Buffalo a couple months ago when he drops that pass and the shoes are on the, are on the other foot, right? You go back to Cincinnati the year prior when he's kind of yelling at Allen and now it's kind of flip like, we had this huge play, this huge moment. Who knows? Maybe he catches that ball, breaks that tackle, goes and scores a touchdown. They win the game, right? Who knows? But like, who knows what came out of that that potentially worsened the relationship? I will say this. Throughout all of Pro Bowl week, when he did those interviews with ESPN and NFL Network, Super Bowl week, when they were asked about it in all those different interviews, Josh's demeanor changed. Now listen, I don't want to get too like... Mm -hmm. in the weeds here. We'll, we'll move into a different direction in a second, but his demeanor when asked about Stefan Diggs goes back to the perfect word that you used. It was a fatigue to have to go into it. And I think that that's probably born out of having to talk about something that you really can't quite talk about. Yeah. So I think a lot of the interviews that he did after the season, I do think there was like some glaring omissions there of things that he also said in, in some of those interviews, uh, which led me to led me to believe that it's not just this critical mass situation that, that people were making it out to be like the, the one thing I, I remember was um, I think when he did the spot on Kay Adams um, and he said something and they, and they extrapolated that, specific quote that was juicy that made it sound like oh i don't know what's gonna happen um and i think he was just talking more so in generalities than than anything mm -hmm. but at the end of the interview he he also said yeah i, I love buffalo i want to be in buffalo e everything like that and so but that wasn't that didn't garner as much attention because you know steph is steph is steph um so i will say that but the I think the way that I would categorize the relationship between those two specifically is, do you know, like, I think everyone kind of has this from some point in their life where you, you're in a workplace, you work with someone, and for some reason, like, everything on paper is like, yeah, we have similar interests, all, all this, or, or you know, we, we, we do the same thing, and and you feel like you should should have a good relationship but for some reason there's just like a there's a level level of off and mm -hmm. not to make it like uncomfortable but to the point where you don't choose perhaps to be around that person um when you don't have to be and not saying that this is exactly what happened but i think this is kind of the read that i had been getting um, with those two. And that is perhaps what led to the Bills being open to parting ways with Stefan Diggs. But like I said before, I don't think the Bills came into this offseason saying, we need to trade Stefan Diggs. 
I think they were certainly open to it, but I don't think that they, I, at one point, I don't think that they thought it was going to happen. And then Houston came in with, with a great offer. Great stuff. Um, let me say right now, um, I told everybody in our shout bills insider text line about Joe coming on today. And there was a lot of excitement because when your mock draft dropped uh, oh, a couple God. days ago, dude, I'm telling you right now, I, I play in a um, Wednesday, Friday um, basketball uh, pickup game. And when we were playing on the day that your mock drop, we went in and played. It starts at six fifteen. Get out at about seven thirty, eight o'clock. Your 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 story must have dropped shortly around or before that time. I literally wasn't in on Transit Road yet, uh, outside of where we play, and I got a text in the group chat of a of a screen grab of the entire um, write up that you did on your mock draft, and people were the comments were flying. It, it really supercharged. A reaction. And so when, when I put out that you were going to be on, I got a lot of uh, feedback from members of the insider text line. Um, and you become can become an insider as well right now by texting 716-528-6727. Uh, two week free trial, $3.99 a month after that. Um, and the Shout Insider text line is brought to you by Terry C. Byer, attorney with the law offices of Francis M. Litro, located at 237 Main Street, Buffalo, New York. If you or someone you know is seriously injured, give them a call, 716-852-1234, or check out LitroLaw.com. All right, Joe, set us up. Big mock draft trade. What do you, what do you have the Bills giving up, and what do you have the Bills getting back, and who do you have them taking? Well, I do want to preface this all by coming to a self-defense here because in mock draft season, a lot of people are like, Oh, you're just trying to get people to click. Okay. And you know me, that is not my game. Yes. I have never, oh, sorry. I have never been like that. I do things rooted out of logic and my analysis always is rooted around things that I think can happen in actuality, not to, not, you know, hype up fans or, you know, just do something that would act, absolutely piss them off, stuff like that. I And that being said, I, in this past mock draft, and this has been something that has been kicking around the brain before the dig steal. It was a giant move up the board to go get one of the top three receivers. And the reason for, the reason that pushed me over the edge to actually do it uh, in a mock draft is because now Brandon Bean has picks to play with in 2025 to where he can rationalize moving a, for a, a first or second round pick next year to go get a guy he is really excited about. And the move that I had them doing was to move up to seven to go get Malik neighbors out of LSU. And if there is a player that I think would genuinely excite Brandon Bean to the point where uh, that he could actually get him because I don't think they're, they're sniffing Marvin Harrison jr. I think he's going to Arizona at four, but if there is a player like most years, Malik neighbors is one uh, wide receiver. One <laughs> most years, Malik neighbors is probably a top three pick, but because of the wide receiver class, because of the quarterback class, there is a legit sh shot that they can, uh, well, that he would be in somewhere in that striking distance of being able to go up and get him. Neighbors to me is just like, he's got star written all over him. And those are generally the type of players that Bean will make a giant move up the board for. So yes, I had them trading away 28. I had them trading away 60. I had them trading away um, their compensatory pick at 133. I had them trading away their 2025 first. But all of that was because Bean could rationalize things like, okay, well, what am I going to get at 28 at receiver? Because right now it's looking like you might not even have a sniff at Adonai Mitchell at from Texas at 28. And I'm not even an Adonai Mitchell guy, but if you wanted a receiver who can also play X, you're probably not looking at getting one at 28. And then at 60, would it hurt to, to give away the, the second round pick? Sure. But some of their needs that they have, that being safety, that being a defensive tackle, a rotational guy, um, 
you can lump in a guard or a slash center into it. All of those needs you can find on, on early day three. So go, I had him going and get the guy he was excited about uh, that potentially excited about in neighbors. And then rationalizing the 2025 piece because having the two second round picks, one of which could be an extremely early second based on the Vikings, what the Vikings do next year. And maybe even pack, packaging those two picks together to move back into the first round in 2025. There's, there's, there are many different avenues for him to do. So I, it is not at all a, oh, this is a fantasy land thing. I think he would actually do it if, if he could, if he could get the deal done. So one of the things about the trade up, so Ryan and I, before the digs trade, we did a whole episode on the Julio Jones trade scenario, which you laid out in your, in your mock mm -hmm. yep. about, you know, giving up all these assets to go up and get a guy that you think can be the change in your offense. Right. So that's one way to approach this. And, and, and one that has some success. Like if you think about it, that team went to a Super Bowl and and almost won a Super Bowl had it not been like for one of the most crazy comebacks of all time. And, and Julio Jones was borderline future hall of famer in his run with the Falcons. And I think that ain't no borderline land, about it. He's a hall of famer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I always couch things, Joe, you know, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm not going no, all. Wait a actually, minute. I don't. You actually, totally I don't. do not couch. Things. Actually, I don't. that's the worst take you've ever had. Honestly, the you're fact right, that you right. couch your takes. Okay. I don't tend to except in the professional realm when we're just <laughs> talking shit around okay. the okay. media table. That's you're fair. right. I That's sling fair. out some pretty obnoxious pineapple in the morning take. bids you. Hello. I thought that was fine, but you know, <laughs> people push back, whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. neither here nor there. I know. Um, so there's that route. And I think the way that you laid this out was interesting because one of the big pushbacks has, has been like the Sammy Watkins trade right in 2014, yep. but as you put it, like, completely different situations ej manuel versus josh allen You're like the player is coming into a completely different environment at that pick and i think like you know if you can if you have a plan for the player and it's rooted in your coaching staff scouting and obviously joe brady has the connections to lsu to be able to probably get the kind of intel on malik neighbors that you would need to make that trade up for me, I wanted to ask you about this because I think I'm a little bit more on the Rome Adunze train than I am neighbors. What do you think about those two players? And if it's apples and oranges, apples and apples, and you just like neighbors better, like what what do you think in comparing those two? And would you say neighbors goes off the board and the Bills could trade up at say nine because the Bears want more capital and they already got their quarterback and they have DJ Moore and Keenan Allen and you get up to nine to get a Dunze. Are you out on the trade up in that scenario? Like talk me through that part of it a little bit. Yeah. So um, I, first I'll, I'll ask you a, a question. Why, why are you in on a Dunze more than, more than neighbors? So I'm not necessarily more than neighbors. I think that um, from a route running separation perspective, I'd probably give the nudge to neighbors, but I think from a well-rounded physical, like, um, kind of receiver, like a, like a dog, I guess a little bit, like in the, in the way that I think that Diggs was and from a character perspective, everything that I've read about that part of things. And maybe that's, you know, reaching a little bit too far. And I don't know how much, like, I'm not saying that neighbors doesn't check the culture box for the bills, but I do know how much they, they care about, you know, character and, and guys coming in that, you know, with a work ethic. And I'm not saying that neighbors doesn't have that, but I know from everything that I've read and I'm actually cheap plug for the athletic. I'm super excited to really dive into Dane Brugler's beast in a couple days here yeah. uh, to get the full rundown on this. Tomorrow but, is beast Eve. It's beast Eve Eve right now. What a, what a, what a, what a, what a time to be alive when that oh, thing yeah. drops on Wednesday. Oh, but, yeah. um, so I guess just from the research that I've done, the, the clips that I've watched, um, I don't necessarily like them more, but I I, I, I like all of the parts for Adunze. Maybe that's um, wrong. I don't think it's necessarily wrong. Um, I like Roma Dunze. Don't get me wrong. I, I think I think he's a, a very good prospect. And just like neighbors, most years he's probably WR1. And he's probably right around the range where he's, he's likely to get drafted in, in this one, which would be somewhere between 7 to 10, I think, is, is the thing that makes most sense for him. Unless he drops out of the top 10 completely, which would be kind of a surprise. Mm -hmm. Um 
I think of the two guys, the one that I think has the best chance to become a superstar in the NFL, to me, that's Malik Neighbors from, from what I have watched. I am thinking about projection. I'm thinking about potential. I am watching everything that Malik Neighbors is doing, and he is checking almost every single box that that I need from a receiver. Um, the only thing that I don't know as much about him as I need to is his blocking, but who the heck cares at that point when you have all when you have all the ability that he does. I mean, is he's not as big as as Roma Dunze. Um, uh, neighbors checked in at, at six foot 199, whereas Adunze is almost six three and two twelve. But from a talent slash what what he does on the field standpoint, the effortless separation for a guy who looks like he can get bigger too, by the way. Um, the effortless se- separation, how good he is in contested situations, his y- yards after catch is the big seller for me which is why i think bean would be all over this guy um because they don't have that that player on the roster like Diggs, even as good as he was he was not a yards after catch guy i mean he was a i'm gonna catch it i'm gonna survey what's around me and if there's a hit coming at me i'm going down i'm not fighting for anything and that helped preserve his career honestly and it's not like it's a bad thing but some other guys are physical getting through contact neighbors does that has the speed to just absolutely burn past people. Neighbors does that. So all of these different things, I, I'm, I think he is an outstanding prospect. And like I said, I really like Roma Dunze. It's not, this is not a Odunze sucks take. I, I think he is an excellent prospect and one that has a really good chance to be a wide receiver one in the NFL. But if I'm making a move like that to get up the board, for a player, I want someone that I think can become one of the best in the NFL at his position. And I think neighbors has that potential. No, I think that you lay that out really well. And I, for those watching, I, I do trust Joe, former wide receiver one himself uh, to uh, <laughs> break down the position at wide receiver. And listen, there's, there's so much to like about neighbors. Here's the thing too, that maybe I, that's pushing me away from the neighbors train is that I think there's a real scenario that plays out where it goes quarterback one two three Harrison at four if there's no trade-ups and then n- neighbors at five to the Chargers I mean yeah listen, the, Charger, that- the Chargers are the um they are the the pinpoint here about whether or not it's actually going to be possible because if if they wind up trading out then that means five is going to be a quarterback or um if they wind up um or or if they take Joe Alt for instance, right. because Harbaugh wants to build up his offensive line. Uh, those are those are two potential outcomes that would help this scenario. But yeah, absolutely. It could happen. Harrison four, neighbors five, and then this whole conversation is moved. So let's get into the non-trade up scenario, because mm-hmm. that's where I think I've centered a lot of my attention on. You know, I did a mock uh, about a month ago and I had the Bills trading back with their first selection taking uh to Vondre Sweat, which I think is probably not going to be in the cards for my next yeah, month. It's not going to age well. No. So, um, but I do think there's got to, you, you had a really good approach in your mock, even though you did the trade up and you lost assets, you had the bills getting neighbors and then coming back with Luke McCaffrey later in the draft. One of the mm-hmm. scenarios that I've kind of thrown around is, oh, okay, sit there at 28, go get um, one of the guys that I think is like in that next bucket of, okay, can separate has the ability to play on the boundary and in, on the inside. To me, those two guys are Ladd McConkey and uh, Xavier Leggett, depending on how you, you know, put those two guys in a, in a, in a blender and see what comes out. I don't know what you're going to like more, but then you could come back maybe in the third round for a guy like a Javon Baker, who I think is super intriguing. Uh, I don't know if you watch much of him, how high you are on him draft Twitter, su- super high on him. I wonder if NFL draft, um, the side of things is going to be as high. Uh, but I think it's got to be a two-pronged approach no matter what you end up landing on. Yeah. Um, I like Javon Baker. Uh, I think the way that I have seen things, and I haven't dove into every single wide receiver prospect, my goal is to get there by the end of this week. I've gotten to most. Um, I haven't gotten to McConkey just yet, so I do apologize for that. That's okay. um, but I've gotten gotten to most. And I really like Javon Baker. Um, but I do think the way this wide receiver class is kind of set up is 
I think there's a, a pretty clear top four, at least from what I've seen. Um, and then there's a drop. That's that's to me. I know a lot of people are in on Adonai Mitchell. Uh, I'm, I think he's fine. I think he blends in with a lot of other uh, prospects just from what I was watching. But that's also said, I'm not really huge into the lack of separation uh, contested guys more, more than uh, uh, type of receivers more than the separators. So maybe that's, that's a personal bias that I have. Um, But that, that being said, I still give everyone kind of a fair shake and Mitchell comes in a little bit, a little bit below or I, cause I grayed out uh, a bunch of guys. And so uh, Mitchell comes in closer to the Javon Baker, uh, Xavier Leggett um, tier than <laughs> J- Jalen Polk, uh, McMillan from from Washington. Those though, that's the type of tier that I'm looking at, where it's like the second tier of guys. So the sticking at 28 thing uh, is interesting. If they stick at 28, I would almost say just don't draft a receiver at 28, right. uh, and then wait to see who out of this cluster who's there at 60. Or if you trade down, like you're talking about, wait to see who's there to whichever point you trade down if you're getting an additional asset on top of that. Um, so I hear I hear what you're saying to me to double dip no matter what. The one thing I will push back on is the is if someone out there is like, okay, take one at 28 and take one at 60 if this class is that loaded. <laughs> It just doesn't make sense because that basically makes the investment in either Khalil Shakir or Curtis Samuel just like dumb or the investment in either your first or second round pick. Like, because they're only playing three receivers at a time due to the presence of Dalton Kincaid at most, by the way. Um, So I just, I, I would not go down that road. I think the more likely option is to take one in the first or second round, then take another one on day three to take advantage of the depth. I like it. Um, I wanted to bring up one more thing real quick about um, the asset. Well, two more things I want to get into. First of all, the trade up. Go, let's go back to that for a second. Mm-hmm. You lose that number 60 pick and then 133. So basically in a draft where you get three players in the top 122, I think it is, you end up just coming away with the one. Mm-hmm. Are you concerned at all? And I know you've kind of talked about this, about like they can fill needs on day three. And I do agree with that, but are you concerned? Like you kind of like to have maybe a couple guys that could compete for starters at other spots, you know, is that does that have anything to do with what you think of the safeties in the second and third round? Does that have anything to do with the fact that maybe a safety that you can get in this draft you don't think is going to be able to kind of win a starting job in year one? I noticed you didn't go edge rusher in in your mock draft. Is that something that you think, okay, the Bills have kind of screwed up, but that's about enough times that just ignore it completely? Or take me into the thought process there and like, don't you think they still need to find some potential, if not starters, contributors? Um, in though on day one, day two, you kind of lose a couple uh hits at that uh with this move. Well, one hit really, yes. Uh, to answer your question, yes, you do miss out on, on another swing, but you're you are also upping the percentage that the receiver you're taking is going to be Josh Allen's number one for the next five years at least, right. um, which takes you all the way through Josh Allen's contract and his prime and the receiver being on a rookie deal. The cost of losing 60 this year uh, to get that. I think makes it makes it um, definitely uh, something that Bean can rationalize. And like I said, this is not me doing this because I want to do this. This is this is like scouting Brandon Bean's tendencies and what what he likes to do, which is to be very aggressive on draft day. So I, I would. That's why I said I continue to believe it. It's potential for all those other positions. Defensive end, yeah, absolutely. I, I kept looking, I kept looking, I kept looking. Nothing made sense to me. From uh, I tried to make it work from who was on the board at, at the at the time of each one. I used I used Pro Football Focus, um, yep. their their mock draft simulator, and none of the prospects just like spoke to me. Where it's like, okay, this guy is really someone that I think the Bills could be interested in. Um, that whether it was a lack of uh, a lack of arm length or a lack of production or, or just something that, that I didn't love from their profile. Uh, so that's, that's what led me to not go with edge rusher. And also remember 
those are going to have about 10 million in cap space when June 1st rolls around. So right. defensive end could be addressed that way. Safety, I think, is one of those spots where they have never made a huge draft investment, which doesn't mean that they won't. But I think for them, they have been so good at getting the most out of what they get to where even if taking one and say the fourth round is still a huge investment for them because they, right. must, and safety is one of those positions where the value um, in late day two, early day three uh, is usually pretty good because that is not a, a position that is a, a high value position throughout the NFL. So that's, that's what all kind of led me to this point. And then defensive tackle is another one, but they're, they're good on defensive tackle for the next two years. Like Daquan Jones has a, basically a two year guarantee. Um, mm-hmm. Ed Oliver is here for the foreseeable and they're looking for a rotational guy. So right. what, what are like, what are they missing out on by, by doing this is, is my big question. Like, is it a day two running back? <laughs> we really want to go down that road again. Um, People are super, is it the kid Benson that the bills are meeting yeah. with that everybody's super excited about? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that would go over quite well with uh, with Bill's Twitter um, or Bill's <laughs> X, I should say, uh, that if they draft another day two running back. But hey, never know. Might happen. Last question. I was listening to Mike Sando's podcast, your colleague on The Athletic. Love with- Sando. He oh. is. He is so such a great guy and he is so good at what he does. Every time he comes to Buffalo just to like parachute in, I am like constantly picking his brain, standing next to him, everything like that. He's he's awesome. He's what I think like a version of you will look like in 30 years. Well, 20 years. He's not that old. Are you, call, are you calling me old? Or are you, you're no, not no, calling no. him that old? Oh, him old, which he's not that old. Um, he's been in right. the game a long time. He started That's off as a, as a Seahawks beat writer, and and he's he's just been incredible. So he does a podcast with Randy Mueller um, mm-hmm. where they kind of take it, uh, take a look at like from a front office perspective at a lot of the things that happen around the NFL. It's a really good listen. I, I highly recommend people give it a, a, a shot. But I was listening to Randy this week, and and I thought there was a nice kind of opportunity to talk this through because he's obviously a former NFL GM. He still watches a lot of tape for that podcast. And his assertion was that the Bills are getting out at the right time from Diggs because he's noticed on tape a significant drop-off as a player. And I know that you've been kind of saying that, like, this is a guy that could still play at a super mm-hmm. high level. And I'm, mm-hmm. I am I bring it up only from the perspective of how do you feel like this is going to work in Houston? Do you think that there's any merit to that? And I mean, Mueller on the podcast said the bills might be even better off with going like with an Odell Beckham jr. Over a declining digs from by looking just at the tape in the limited role that he had in Baltimore last year, which I thought was interesting. What do you think about that? What do you think the player dig still is? And how do you think he's going to fit into a, a situation with a burgeoning one in Nico Collins, a potential one B in Tank Dell, and now where does he fit into all of it? I think Diggs is going to be great in Houston. <laughs> like, like the dude, the dude can play. Um, I guess not everyone has to agree when they watch film, but I have been watching Stefan Diggs dating back to me watching every single one of his snaps in Minnesota. Mm-hmm for the article that I did once they acquired him. So this is, this is like five seasons of work. I don't see the drop off from what he did in the second half of the season that, that, uh, that Randy might've been talking about. And that's not to say that, you know, sometimes, sometimes these things happen um, with 30 year old receivers and, and you start to get a little bit nervous about it. And, and, you know, that's kind of one of those things within the NFL. It's like, Oh, once you hit that 30 mark, taking time bomb, get away from it. Um, even if it's not always the case, but to me, I saw digs getting open, uh, late in the season. I saw a lot of quick decisions from Josh Allen to the point where, we didn't really get to see the full scope of the Stefan Diggs route. A lot of it was in defense of being, being defended by the cover two shell. Uh, so that that's a piece of it. And it just seemed like there was a lot of quick stuff with, with Josh in the second half of the season uh, as opposed to the first. So I think that might be part of it. And then also his snap count went down, you know, that's, that's a, that's a different conversation entirely, but I am still of the belief that Stefan Diggs can separate really well. Did he have 
a few drops down the stretch? Yes. But if you look at the scope of his season, he had so few drops early on in the year, his drop rate was still basically his his career percentage uh, from, sure. from 2023. So I'm not, I'm not sitting here being a, a Stefan Diggs defender or anything like that. I'm just showing you what I... I'm just giving you what what I see uh, from a weekly basis. Did yes, he grade? Right. Did he grade yes, out? Oh, I yes, you are. Yes, did you are. He, no, I'm not. I'm not. The, I'm not defending you. Guy. I'm not the, no, 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 no. We are rooted <laughs> in logic and analytical things, Matt. Um, and yeah, I it, was he worse in the second half of the season from a grading perspective? From from for me, yes. But I think, I think the scope of his season makes it to have him be one of their best graded out offensive players and one of their best graded out players from last year. So uh, I didn't, I didn't see the the great fall off that uh, some others have. This has been so awesome. Uh, thank you so much for taking some time out to dive into this uh, a little bit. I think it's helpful like that, that second level now where we had the first reaction, we had the days after reaction and now just like a little bit of a, uh, you know, look back, like mm-hmm. where this thing, how this thing got here and maybe some of the lessons that I think could be taken in the future from this and, and applied in the future. That could be conversations that we have down the line. Uh, but I want to give you a chance real quick. Let everybody know what you have coming up. Obviously, draft season. So oh, plenty yeah. of stuff over on The Athletic. Uh, anything you want to shout out? Yeah, no, just uh, I'll be having something on all these receivers at some point whenever whenever I feel comfortable enough to uh, to actually do it. And the beast is coming out from Dane Brugler in a couple of days. So that's that's going to be awesome over at The Athletic to where you can really dive in uh, and then just constant. Uh, you know, you know me, uh, just constant bills analysis. I'll be doing my draft files this year like I do every year where it's just this this unpacking of the notebook that is just my entire draft brain that comes out within like the, the week of, of the draft. So I'll, I'll be doing that too. So uh, all that at the athletic, and then you can listen to me over at the Buffalo beat meander for a little while. Like I did here for a couple minutes. Uh, anytime you can get some Biscalia brain uh, in your daily <laughs> life, I highly recommend it. Uh, like just let it flow, let it flow. Mm. It's, it's great stuff. You're the best. Um, Thank you for for joining us. Thanks for having me, Matt.